Today is a very special day. According to some, the two days that follow today are more significant, but to me, as someone who plays video games a lot, it's a particularly important day in the history of gaming, as it is the day that racing games grew up. This might seem quite hyperbolic. How can a genre of video games grow up? Well, there was a time where racing games were on two extremes – simple arcade-style fun and hardcore simulation. In 1990, you had a choice between, say, F-Zero with its futuristic high-speed fantasy racing, or Indianapolis 500 The Simulation, with its complex racing physics for the time. This game, however, bridged the gap between the two. Providing a complex driving model to please those who wanted a bit of bite to their racing, whilst also making it appeal to a wider audience with cars they recognise and aspire to get. To different people, this game, and this series for that matter, means different things. It means their first foray into car culture, their first go at a racing game with a simulated edge, their first look at 3D racing games. But whatever it means to some, what is certain is that when it launched on this day in 1997, it left a profound impression for the next 25 years. Today, we pay tribute to one of gaming's most important franchises, Gran Turismo. Gran Turismo is a racing game developed by the studio Polyphony Digital, who at the time were known as Polis Entertainment. It released for the Sony PlayStation in Japan in 1997, with its eventual Western versions releasing in May 1998. It is a game in which you drive cars of various makes and models, from pokey little K cars and subcompacts, to full-blooded racing machinery, all with the aim of making a living of being on the edge of control of your vehicle. So what exactly gave birth to this game? How did it establish the rules that arcade simulation racing games would follow for the next 25 years? Well, to answer all these questions, we have to talk about the game's development, and the tale begins with a man called Kazunori Yamauchi. Kazunori Yamauchi grew up a huge car enthusiast, since the age of three. When he was 24, he took out a five-year loan to buy a Nissan Skyline GTR R32, the top-of-the-line sports car developed by the Japanese automotive giant. He then crashed it six months into owning it. He was driving at around 200 km per hour on public roads without insurance. Whilst Yamauchi was fine, the car very much was not, leaving Yamauchi with payments to fulfil on a loan taken out for a car that could no longer be driven. Whilst that was going on, however, something in him was brewing – a desire to make a game about driving cars the kinds of cars you might see on the road, at the track, and racing in competition. His desire to capture the essence of 1990s car culture led to him laying down the groundwork for Gran Turismo, whose development began in 1992. He found himself working for Sony in the early 1990s, working on the hardware design and the controller for the upcoming PlayStation, as well as overseeing the development of games made under Sony Music Entertainment's software label, and found himself fascinated at what the console promised to do. In that time, he devised plans in which he could make the game he most desperately wanted to make. He would go on to make a racing game before long called Motor Toon Grand Prix, which released around the time of the PlayStation's launch in 1994, exclusively in Japan. It was a kart racer in the vein of Super Mario Kart, with a very cartoony and even exaggerated aesthetic, with cars distorting as they drive around corners. This gave Yamauchi more drive than ever to work on Gran Turismo, as it was followed up by a sequel, Motortoon Grand Prix 2, which got a worldwide release and featured a much more refined physics model, one that would play a key part in this story. After Motortoon Grand Prix 2's development was completed, Polis Entertainment set to work on finishing off Gran Turismo, which was held back for a while so the NTGP games could be made to generate some cash flow and give everyone some experience with what they were working with. The development of the game was not easy, and it involved a lot of work that others might not expect to have to do, as it involved a lot of negotiations with car manufacturers to make their cars drivable in a game sold to the masses. There were also a few challenges involved in developing the game on the technical side. Whilst it was designed to take advantage of what the hardware offered, 
in order for the game to look good and run as well as it did, the game needed to be written in assembly code, rather than the standard libraries offered to them by the PlayStation development kits. It also led to the game's design having to be altered somewhat, but we'll touch on that later. This arduous task saw them run fairly close to midnight in the end, but after five years of work, the game finally saw Japanese store shelves on the night before the night before Christmas, before releasing in May the following year everywhere else. Releasing to critical acclaim, Gran Turismo became one of Sony's biggest franchises virtually overnight, as the game shifted 2 million units in Japan alone by the time of the game's Western release. It would go on to take the title of the biggest selling video game on the entire Sony PlayStation, with a sales figure of 10.85 million units. For comparison, the next best selling racing game that isn't Gran Turismo on the PlayStation is Crash Team Racing which sold a very impressive 4 million units, but still could not hold a candle to the overwhelming statistical strength in Gran Turismo's numbers. Receiving praise for its graphics and driving model, Gran Turismo would go on to be regarded as one of the greatest racing games ever made, with Top Gear regarding it as the greatest. IGN labelled Gran Turismo as the second most influential racing game behind Pole Position. All this praise but does it live up to it all 25 years after the fact? Well, for now, we've got a box and its contents to look at first, so let's get to it. This copy of Gran Turismo is a PlayStation the Best release, like the copy of Intelligent Cube that I covered some time back. Actually, thinking about it, that just leaves me saddened about how little I've done over these past 18 months. Anyway, the cover art is a couple particularly well-detailed cars with a cloudy backdrop, complete with a burnt orange filter and the game's logo imposed on top of it all. For the longest time, I thought the T was meant to be an R for some reason. Basically, the idea is it's supposed to look like a checkered flag after a fashion, but it's one of those things that doesn't click until you think about it for long enough. It's like the old F1 logo where the one was in the negative space. But frankly, if it took me that long to realise that, then is it really that great a logo? Eh, anyway, below the logo is the game's name and, crucially, the tagline that sold the game all around. The Real Driving Simulator. These days it seems a little quaint to advertise it in this way, but back in 1997, this worked because nobody had seen anything like it before. Even Test Drive and Need for Speed couldn't compare beyond their usage of existing car manufacturers. The cover itself is pretty solid, but it isn't my favourite of the ones around. The PAL release had the logo seemingly imprinted into a tyre. It works in the context of the game for sure, but it's probably my least favourite, despite how well it communicates the game's concept. Instead, my favourite cover is the NTSC release. Yep, once again, America gets my seal of approval for the best cover, and I wish I could say this was close. The moody background, the bright, confident and bold logo, and the Christmas gift under a nice silver wrap makes this one of my favourite covers, honestly. For now, let's return to the Japanese box and look at the back. Simultaneously, there's a lot going on and not a lot at all. Imagery is kept to a minimum with just a few illustrations of cars in the middle with all of the text showcasing the manufacturers and cars within the game. How would you describe this? Maximalist minimalism? There isn't a lot to talk about with this because it's just text. Somewhat like the train spotting poster, but less memorable. Oh well, let's have a look inside. The game disc on the right will come in handy shortly, but on the left we have an absolute beefsteak of an instruction manual. It's almost 100 pages long and covers virtually every single aspect of the game in detail, from the menus to the driving to even car customization. The majority of the instructions are written in Japanese, so of course if you can't read that then you're probably not going to get all that much from this. But at the very least if you understand the language, there's a lot to garner from this manual. Anyway, we've done enough reading for now, so let's get on with the game. The game loads right into a full motion video introduction with quiet scenery at dawn. A leaf drags itself along a road as a bird lands atop a lighting pylon, before suddenly it lights up. A shot of a grandstand at a racetrack, then followed by numerous other shots, as the day gets brighter and things come to life, leading into the theme of Gran Turismo.
Actually, no. Theme undersells it. I posit it would be more accurate to refer to it as an anthem instead, because this music, Moon Over the Castle, is just pure auditory excellence. More on the music later though, we emerge into the game's main menu seeing a few options. Arcade mode, Gran Turismo, Replay Theatre, and Option. Whilst there's a fair bit to do in arcade mode, I think our attention is best directed towards the Gran Turismo mode for now, so let's check that out to see a map of a city. In this city map we see numerous dealerships for manufacturers, and we notice that we have a million credits to our name! That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Let's go and buy ourselves an Aston Martin and have ourselves a grand old time! Oh. One million credits is worth diddly here. It's worth remembering that this version is the Japanese release, and so it follows the monetary logic Japan runs on. Translate one dollar or one pound to 100 yen in your head, and it makes sense. In essence, one million yen is roughly equivalent to 10,000 pounds or 10,000 dollars for our purposes here. When put into perspective like that, it starts to sound somewhat insignificant. But not to worry, as there are dealerships that sell cars that are not only available to buy brand new at that price, but also used cars that can be better to start out with. However, you won't be able to do much until you take part in something of a rite of passage in Gran Turismo, the license tests. This is where the game teaches you the basics of driving in Gran Turismo, with acceleration and braking, cornering, and full lap tests to get you to understand how to work your way around the cars and tracks in this game. In the license tests, you'll be given a time to beat in order to secure a bronze rating for that test, indicating a pass, with better times giving you potentially silver and even gold rankings. Simply passing every license test in a given category is enough to attain the license, but if you want to go one step further, you can, and you'll get a reward out of it in the shape of a car. Alternatively, once you've got your license, you can just go ahead, buy a car, and drive it there and then, no questions asked. So once we've gotten our B license, let's buy ourselves a tofu delivery truck and make our way to the meat of this game, the racing. Your first taste of racing competition will usually come in the form of qualifying. From a standing start, you do a lap of the circuit to determine your position on the grid for the race, and it's not the best start. In concept, this makes sense. You're about to take part in a race, so determining where you belong in the pack follows logically from that. It makes sense to see how fast your car is in preparation for the race, and to see if you need to improve anything before taking part. It also helps that there is a monetary prize awaiting you if you get pole position for the race. The problem is the qualification system is a bit wonky to say the least. Qualification times for competing cars besides your own are suggested to be constant, meaning that if the same lineup of cars takes part in the same qualifying session, the times and the order will be much the same barring you. However, it tells you nothing of your actual performance, as you'll sometimes be slower in qualifying but far quicker in the race, or the other way around a bullet in qualifying, but a rust bucket in the race. This would be fine, but for an example, let's take this A86. In the Sunday Cup, it is slower than any other car in qualifying by a fair margin. Despite that, I am able to beat most of the cars on the first lap alone, if not all of them. In other races, even when I am about 15 seconds off the qualifying pace with this car, I am still able to keep pace in the race. It's very inconsistent. Thankfully, if you know there's no point to you qualifying, you can just skip it, wait a couple seconds, and go into the race preparation screen. When you're ready, you get thrown into the cockpit of your car, and the race start procedure begins. It's a bit late to talk about the controls, but it's hardly a bad time at any rate. The controls are quite simple, by default the X button is your accelerator button, and square is your brake. Circle is your handbrake and triangle is reverse, with a directional pad steering you left and right. If you're racing with manual transmission instead of automatic, the L2 and R2 shoulder buttons shift up and down respectively. L1 allows you to look behind you if you need more than the virtual mirror at the top of the screen, whilst R1 changes your view between chase and bumper cam. I will be playing in bumper cam since it's how I play these kinds of racing games, but do whatever you want. 
One particularly important feature with Gran Turismo is how it is the first Sony PlayStation game to make full use of the DualShock controller. The game includes not only vibration feedback for the controller, but also analog control, and it provides a dizzying array of options to the player. For example, the left analog stick can be used for steering and the right analog stick for throttle and braking. There are myriad other options to choose from and you can modify them to your heart's content. In fact, if you have a compatible wheel and pedals, you can play using that as well. There are a lot of options to work with here. Since it's the option I and many people at the time would have had, I am playing with the DualShock controller with the left analog stick for steering. No right analog stick, throttle and brake though. I've grown too used to using the face buttons for throttle and brake. At the end of each race, your finishing position dictates the value of your prize, as well as how many points you score in the championship you are taking part in. The point system works as follows. 9 points for a win, 6 for second, 4 for third, and decrement all the way down to 1 point for sixth. By the end of the championship, the one with the most points is the winner. Winning the championship will net you an even bigger sum of money, as well as a new car for you to look at. And maybe even drive! Or sell off to buy a new turbo for old reliable. Championships are repeatable as well, so if you clear it, you can compete in it again and get the same rewards. It's pretty handy for when you want to amass a decent amount of money relatively quickly, but we're touching on a problem with this game's design that I think deserves address later on. I also want to make mention of the AI in this game. The programming of the AI is intended to make it so that the cars are never entirely too fast for you, and likewise, you're never too fast for them. Usually. The rubber banding doesn't quite work like that all of the time, and there are plenty of races where the computer or you are faster than the other. That said, it doesn't feel particularly egregious when it's against you. You don't even really f tend to notice it, but it's there all the same. In races where, by all means, I should not have been competitive, I have not had to worry about everyone going off into the distance because my opponents are kept in relative proximity to me, just far enough away that I can just about see them. On the other hand, I have had races where I am so far ahead of everyone else that the game's programming can't really do anything about it. In endurance races especially, I lap the competitors so readily that it feels almost cruel. I should also make reference to what I said earlier concerning how the game's design was changed slightly. Well, due to how constricted the PlayStation's whopping 33 MHz CPU was, it caused some corners to be cut. Originally, races were intended to have up to 12 cars in them. Sadly, however, even with the whole game written in assembly, it was infeasible to get 12 cars working, and 6 appeared to be the most sensible compromise. This compromise would haunt the series until Gran Turismo 5 up the car limit, but oh well. For the time being, however, let's talk about one of the key things about racing games, the cars. A racing game isn't much of a racing game without the things that facilitate the racing in the first place. There are around 140 cars in Gran Turismo, which, for a game of its vintage, is a substantial number. These cars are split between numerous different makes that you can buy from. It being a Japanese game, it's little surprise the vast majority of the selection are from Japanese makes, like Honda, Toyota, Mitsubishi, Subaru, Mazda, and Nissan. There are also American makes Dodge, whose cars featured under the Chrysler name here, and Chevrolet, and British makes Aston Martin and TVR round out the selection. For the most part, you're going to be gravitating towards the Japanese makes as you start out, as they tend to have cheaper cars available to you. The American makes tend to have pricier muscle cars, whilst the British makes tend to sell Grand Tourers. Get it? Because it's in the name! The Japanese makes tend to run the gamut from having funky little K-cars, to hatchbacks, to four-door saloons, to beefy, heavily tunable sports cars. The cars in this game can be tuned to hell and back, but more on that later. The selection of cars on offer is a solidly reasonable gathering. You have the cars people aspire to have, like the Nissan R32 and R33 Skyline GTRs. You have the Mazda RX-7 and Unos Roadster. You have the Honda NSX, the Toyota Supra, the Mitsubishi Evos, the Subaru Impressors, and so many more. Then you have the funky K cars and the hatchbacks that you buy less because you want or desire them, but more because you need to get them in order to progress through the game. Though it still gives you the opportunity to at least look at what you're buying first. 
Whilst I'll be talking about the progression in this game later on, it gives you a solid idea of what to expect as you start climbing the ladder and acquiring the more expensive machinery, thanks to your payouts increasing as well as your experience. For the time being, however, I want to talk about the physics in Gran Turismo. The physics engine is based on that one used in Motor 2 Grand Prix 2, and whilst calling this realistic would be like calling the craze a historical document, there are some things to consider with the physics. Unlike many arcade races of the time, where vehicles felt more like slot cars than they did bulky heaps of metal, Gran Turismo gave the cars heft. The 100 plus cars in this game are weighty, and have power and speed to them. They feel like an actual thing that you are in control of, rather than something that wants you to think you're in control of it. Cornering is also a surprisingly natural and satisfying process with the cars in this game. The handling characteristics of each car are unique, so whilst my AE86 here navigates these corners with pace, if not finesse, this here Camaro Z28 seems almost allergic to the concept of it. In a sense, it's quite true to life. This game made use of an obsessive attention to detail on the part of the game's developers, making sure every single aspect of the cars could translate into the game, so that the player could drive a version of that car rather than a cheap, cartoonish facsimile of it. If there's one observation with this game's handling, however, it's the physics are designed to enable you to perform power slides and drifts, seemingly with minimal effort. I'm not that sort of driver though, I just want the car to be somewhat predictable on the limit. Despite that, I don't find the drifty control to be that much of an issue or distraction, simply another way in which the cars handle around the circuit. It's not that big a deal to me, even if I'm not super fond of it. Maybe I'm just used to later instalments where drifting was a skill you developed over time, rather than have the game do it mostly for you. Do I sound like a boomer yet? I shouldn't, because I didn't play this game until a long time after playing Gran Turismo 3 A-Spec and Gran Turismo 4. In those games, drifting was basically something you did on your own time. That being said, if there's one thing the Gran Turismo games have never really had the best track record with, it's crash physics. It especially doesn't help that it took until the fifth mainline instalment for crash damage to be implemented, and it was, all told, pretty poor against its contemporaries. Given the hardware this was being pushed on, expecting anything particularly accurate for crash damage would be a bit unfair, although it is a little sad that there isn't even a mechanical damage system, let alone body damage. Cygnosis's Destruction Derby games featured such a system, where the car would progressively suffer mechanical damage the more you crashed or were crashed into. It introduced Jeopardy into the racing, and it fit with the theme of banger racing the games were going with, and it achieved it on the very same console. If there's one justification for why there's no damage mechanic, it's probably because they wanted to preserve a bit of artistic freedom and make it so that it was less frustrating for players. Crashing is consequential, in that you lose speed and time, but it's not unrecoverable. That's not to say some crashes aren't serious. At Special Stage Route 11, there are a couple chicanes where you arrive at high speed and have to navigate them without making contact with any of the barriers, otherwise your speed disappears into the ether and you're rushing to catch back up. But for the most part, relatively minor collisions between drivers tend not to have any serious effect. Unless a difference in momentum is so massive, you'll bounce off one another and keep going with a minor loss in speed. It's not entirely realistic and it puts a question mark on this game's branding, but it's fine, it's a game, it knows what it is. It's aware that it doesn't have to apply absolutely every concept to do with realism here, otherwise crashing would probably kill you in real life, or you may have to start paying higher costs for cars due to inflation. Oh wait, they actually did that in Gran Turismo 7. God damn it. And on that note of paying for things, let's talk about buying cars and doing things with them beyond simply driving them. I am of course talking about upgrading them with new parts to improve your performance in races. There are eight main categories of parts, exhaust, brakes, engine, drivetrain, turbo, suspension, wheels and others. Most categories will have submenus within for particular components. For instance, in the drivetrain category, you'll be shopping around for gearboxes, prop shafts, flywheels and clutches. The others category consists of two things to look at weight reduction, and racing modification. Every single road car can be modified for racing, which applies a livery, new wheels, further weight reduction, and the ability to modify downforce. However, 
it requires buying all three weight reduction kits before you can apply the racing mod. Buying new components can make a massive difference in terms of performance. Better brakes can reduce the amount of time and distance needed for braking, a new clutch and flywheel can make gear shifts functionally seamless, anti-roll bars can improve your car's stability through corners, and so on. However, some parts are more adjustable than others. This is where parts like the gearbox and suspension come in, among a few other things. The more basic versions of the parts like the gearbox and suspension assemblies can be modified slightly, but if you want to go the whole hog, you've got to buy the most expensive versions of them. With this, you get access to changing so much of the suspension geometry and gear ratios that you can tune your car to just how you want it. You can even tune stuff like the turbo level, brake bias and so on. It should be stressed that you need to know what you're doing with this if you want to see a genuine improvement, otherwise you are going to struggle. If you don't know your way around the suspension of a car, you can end up causing more problems than you solve. The best advice would be to make changes to one part at a time to see if it improves something, and to test run it to see if it works. Otherwise, if you just guess, you can end up with a car you won't want to drive. When you get it just right though, when the car is set up just as you want it, and it makes its way through the course like it's on rails, then it feels all the more satisfying for it. It is such a gratifying feeling when it works well. One key aspect to a racing game alongside the cars is the tracks you race on. To put it bluntly, a racing game lives and dies by not just its cars and its driving model, but also its circuit selection. It's all well and good having a billion different Nissan Skylines, of which you'll drive maybe two of them, if the circuits aren't worth racing on. Thankfully, the variety of tracks Gran Turismo has is pretty impressive for a first outing. There's only about ten different circuits that you race on, but on the whole, as circuits go, I don't really dislike any of them. I'm going to start with the three permanent tracks that have just the one layout, starting with Deep Forest Raceway, a sweeping circuit with plenty of corners to tickle your fancy, including a quick left-hand kink that, if you're brave, you can take flat. The second permanent track with one layout is Trial Mountain, a circuit with a lot of elevation changes and plenty of complex corner sequences, and a few straights to stretch your legs. There's also a chicane that fully invites you to take a Hail Mary. The last permanent single layout facility is High Speed Ring, a circuit whose whole premise is speed. There are several high banked corners and long straights connecting them, with a corner complex that keeps you on your toes. As for the other circuits with multiple layouts, here's the other permanent circuit starting with Autumn Ring. The mini layout is a simple and short layout that sees you attacking every corner to cut your time down as low as you can. The full layout, however, features a section that loops over itself. Grand Valley Speedway is the other permanent circuit with two layouts. Its shorter east layout is another fast-flowing layout, much like Deep Forest Raceway, but the full layout introduces a few trickier sections, like a few hairpins, including the double hairpin near the end of the lap. It's a very technical track and probably one of the best in the series. That's not all for the circuits, however, as there are two street circuits, one that has two layouts and another that has just the one. The first is Special Stage Route 5, a somewhat technical street circuit in the dark, with a shorter Clubman circuit that's more about raw speed than SSR 5's tight and twisty circuit. And then there's Special Stage Route 11, arguably the hardest circuit of them all. If Route 5 is tight and twisty, then this is a helter skelter. It's not often that you're given an opportunity to stretch your legs around here, instead your eyes are on stalks to make sure you're not crashing. There's quite a varied array of circuits on offer here, there's a lot to please even the most picky racer. If you want a fast flowing circuit then High Speed Ring and Deep Forest are perfect for you. Fancy a tricky layout for driving fast? Try on Mountain and Special Stage Route 11 should suit you great. Want something to bomb around in low speed machinery? Then how about Clubman Stage Route 5 or Autumn Ring Mini? The only downside to this is there are no real world circuits, just fantasy tracks that take some inspiration from existing circuits. Real circuits wouldn't come until the following entry, but for starting out it's not necessarily a bad thing. But wait, there's more! 
On top of the 10 tracks you get to race on, you also get to race on reverse configurations of these tracks. Now you get to suffer through Special Stage Route 11, but now in the opposite direction! Before I touch on a couple of topics concerning this game, I think it best to talk about the game's presentation. And as usual, I'm going to focus on the visuals before coming around to the audio. Gran Turismo is probably one of the best looking 3D games on the PlayStation. And I say this knowing that the PlayStation has a wealth of great looking 3D games for its time, looking great for different reasons from one another. In this case, it's a mixture of technical prowess and smart visual touches on everything, from the cars to the tracks upon which they race. Firstly, let's get the technical stuff out of the way. It's somewhat unfortunate that I report this game has a rather strange way of dealing with resolutions, as it is one of the numerous games on the PlayStation that exhibit the problem of resolution switching. In races, you are looking at an image output at 240p at 30 frames per second, a perfectly reasonable image for the time and it handles it respectably well, albeit with a little slowdown. Outside of races, it's a bit of a crapshoot as to whether it's 240p or 480i. The best way I can explain it is that if you are about to take part in a race, the game will output to 240p, whilst in menus away from the racetrack, so on the Gran Turismo mode screen and the like, you're getting a 480i image. It's not very consistent and it makes it slightly harder to present than I would like. What also doesn't help is that even when it's at 240p, it isn't free of problems. Every now and again, the output will sometimes show one row of pixels at either the top or bottom as missing. On the OSSC, you can resolve this by using the vertical back porch setting in the sampling options, but that it does it as unpredictably as it does is pretty rubbish. Of course, if you're playing on a CRT, the overscan will take care of this, and its general responsiveness will deal with the resolution switching, but given my setup, that's something I have to make do with. In spite of these resolution issues, however, Gran Turismo has gathered a bit of a reputation as a graphical showcase, and it's pretty clear to see why. The cars look good. Cars are relatively simple shapes for a console to render, but there's a surprising amount of detail in these cars all the same. The cars show some particularly good attention to detail with suspension movement. Even if the wheel sometimes clips through the car's wheel arches, it still looks quite impressive for the console. The textures of the cars also have a lot going on. Plenty of detail on the textures gives you an idea of what make the car is, and you can even see a reflective effect on the car. Even better, if your car isn't as shiny as it once was, you can go to the car wash to get your car back to its showroom fresh splendour. There is the oddity of the car's reflection showing off a blue sky whilst in a tunnel, but you can't have everything. The game was already pushing about 75% of the console's raw power, and expecting more from it was probably going to cause problems. In any case, the reflective texture does at least change depending on the time of day the race is at. The tracks you race at also look really good. The tarmac looks clean and detailed, there's plenty of useful contrast and lots of things to focus your attention on for when you inevitably need to brake, and the ancillary stuff surrounding the circuit, the things that make the races events that people are actually watching, also looks pretty convincing. There are a couple of details worth pointing out, however. The virtual mirror in the top of the screen shows simplified geometry compared to normal, so you'll see cars with less complex geometry, and the track will appear relatively bare bones. It's there so you can check on what's behind you, rather than have you distracted by what there is. Though it can be a little distracting when you notice you're driving on tarmac looking forward, but through grass according to the virtual mirror. You might also have noticed there's a lot of divvering going on, You'll notice it especially on the tarmac and the sky, as it tries to squeeze out more colours than the system can output easily. It's not an unusual technique and I don't mind it at all, but it can get a little distracting. The cars also have working lights, which allows you to determine when a driver is braking for a corner and so on. That said, there are limitations. They don't actually light the road up, not that the circuits aren't already lit well enough as they are, and they don't appear until maybe too late. This is a problem to do with this game's draw distance, where some aspects are hidden before the console decides to render them. However, as problems go, I can think of worse ones to have than this, considering the track draw distance is pretty good as is. You'll see the track you're aiming for well in advance of when you get to it, don't worry. 
The menus are also quite straightforward. A lot of attention to detail was paid to make sure the player understood where to go and what to do. What do you want to do? Go racing. Do you have the B license? No? Well, get the B license then. How do I do that? Go down to the driving school and complete the B license tests. However, one thing that I don't particularly like about the user interface, particularly in menus, is how text input is handled with the kind of keyboard that it is. It feels cumbersome and weird to me. In the Gran Turismo mode menus as well, when you're going through dealerships, customization, events and all of that, you can accidentally send yourself to your home, your garage or anywhere that isn't where you want to be, because of the hotbar on the left. I'm not sure it was a necessary feature. Helping this game's importability here is the use of a lot of English language. Some of it is a little awkward, what with the game being Japanese and all, but for the most part you get the gist, and even where it is not in English, it's usually in katakana, meaning you can translate it all fairly quickly if you can read it. If not, then just print a cheat sheet out. The only other thing I don't like about this game's visuals is the flashing text that appears whenever you get a new record or a prize in races. It's an annoying sort of strobe effect that makes it a bit too intense to look at. If you're wondering why I put a warning at the start of this video about flashing effects, there's your answer. And to move on from the visual stuff, we come to the audio. I'll start with the game's sound design first before I move on to the soundtrack, which, if you couldn't tell already, I absolutely love. It's genuinely great. Anyway, before I get too carried away, let's talk about sound design. This is one aspect that Kazunori Yamauchi looks back on, wishing it was better, but wasn't able to improve owing to time constraints. In some respects I can understand why, because there are a few issues here and there, but on the whole, you can do far worse than this. Engine sounds are the big one here. The sounds rise in pitch based on engine res, which is pretty simple, and the lower rev counts below the red line and around the point where it'll shift optimally, it sounds pretty much fine with a little bit of detail. It's clear, however, that once you start hitting higher rev ranges, such as hitting the red line in top gear, that it's not exactly the best audio quality. It can sound harsh and raspy at the top end, and the detail gets barely lost. Not utterly terrible by any means, but not exactly the pinnacle of racing game audio design either. Despite that, most of Gran Turismo's sound work does what it needs to do. The car collisions sound reasonably impactful, but not excessively so, nor too weak. Tire squeal is borderline iconic for the early entries in the series, and let's not forget the start procedure klaxon. Even the menu sounds have a playful, even delightful tone to them. The little details here and there, like the guitar twangs when buying new components, are nice to hear, and even though it can be by the numbers in places, Generally speaking, I like it. But now I get to talk about the music and boy howdy you are not ready. Before I continue however, I must stress that this being the Japanese release means the music here is very different to the PAL and NTSC releases, as they used very different music throughout the game. Or at least for the most part it's different. The music in the races is different at the very least. The composition of this game's soundtrack was done by two different individuals. Firstly, let's introduce you to Isamu Ohira, a graduate of Berklee College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts in 1991, and is currently an amateur ornithologist if his Instagram is anything to go by. His work isn't especially prominent in this first instalment, primarily heard in places that are a little quieter or jazzier. You'll typically hear his music in some of the menu screens, but what is there was good enough that he would stick around as composer for a few more entries in the series. For as good as Ohira's work is, however, it's hard for most to compare to the likes of Masahiro Ando. Ando has had a long and storied career of close to 50 years as a founding member of the band The Square. He has since retired from the band as of 2021, but prior to then, he released untold works as part of The Square, with perhaps the most well known of their songs being Truth, which, for an English equivalent, is as iconic as Fleetwood Max The Chain and for the same reason. It was used as Fuji Television's intro music to its Formula One racing broadcasts. Where music composition for video games is concerned, this isn't Ando's first rodeo either. Prior to Gran Turismo, his work featured in the tactical RPG video game series Ark the Lad. Hmm, tactical RPG, now there's an idea. 
Most of the music you'll be hearing in this game will likely have been penned by Ando, with his distinctive guitar driving the music along gracefully. There aren't many tracks in this soundtrack, but what it lacks in quantity, it makes up for in quality, because I have listened to these tracks so much already, and not once have I become sick of them. His biggest opus on this soundtrack, however, is undoubtedly Moon Over the Castle. Now, this is actually an adaptation of another work from The Square called Night Song from the album Blue in Red. There are a few notable differences, however. Ando's guitar takes centre stage instead of Masato Honda's Iwi, and the production feels a lot rockier by comparison to the original. This is not to say by any means that the original isn't good, though. Night Song is an excellent track still, but Moon Over the Castle is in a league of one, as racing game main themes go. There's a feeling of triumph in Moon Over the Castle, helped in no small part by its orchestral opening and closing, roaring guitar and synth work, as well as knowing just how long is long enough. It doesn't stick around for too long, but when it's there, it's powerful enough to grab you by the scruff of the neck and get you to pay attention. It's such a powerful anthem and I utterly adore it. In fact, it is such an anthem, the entire Gran Turismo series has had Moon Over the Castle as its main Japanese theme since the start. It is such a mainstay that Bring Me the Horizon performed a cover version for Gran Turismo 7, and, uh, well, it's certainly an interpretation. I'll just stick to classic Ando. Now to bring us back to the gameplay and onto what makes Gran Turismo what it is in the eyes of its millions of fans, the progression. I have in the past described this game as a racing collectathon, and it might seem derogatory to refer to it in that sense, but I can't really think of a better way to describe the Gran Turismo games, really. The whole process is to get cars and maybe upgrade them to compete in races and championships to earn money and get more cars. That's the meat and potatoes of this game's design, and to be sure, it does a decent job of keeping the player interested with the drip feed of rewards. Gran Turismo understands that it has to showcase the progression of not just the speed of the cars, but also the player's capabilities in handling the different cars in the game, because when the speed increases, so do the demands they place on you. Races get longer, payouts get bigger, the competition gets tougher, the stakes are high, especially in the higher level championships, and making a drastic error can be the difference between a huge payout and huge disappointment. It can be a properly crushing game at points, but ultimately, many of these issues are down to the player, be it through misjudging a corner's breaking point, or having your slipstream taken advantage of. It can really feel like you've had the wind stripped from you, a la J.R. Hildebrand. But in spite of how brutal this game can be at points, the feeling of overcoming a challenge that takes time to complete is genuinely euphoric. It feels like a real-life race win, especially after a particularly gruelling race that was won at the last. As you make more progress, earn more money, buy faster cars and upgrade them to turn them into racing machines, the kinds of races you take part in also change. Once you reach a certain point, the races start to take on a format that the series likes to make use of. Endurance racing. Endurance races can last around 100 minutes with even the fastest cars in the game, as you drive races such as the Grand Valley 300 km. These races are, as you can guess, much longer than most races in games up to this point, which is cool, but they also feature a few other interesting things. Firstly, throughout the game you may have been upgrading your car to use different tyres, as they confer a grip advantage to you compared to the usual street tyres your car starts out with. Now, however, endurance races introduce a new feature, tyre wear. The softer the tyre, the sooner it becomes useless. After a while, you'll make your way into the pits to take a pit stop for new tyres so that you don't start feeling like you're driving a car whose boots feel like they've been on black ice. I enjoy longer forms of racing, so the Gran Turismo franchise featuring endurance races is a huge boon for me. It's a kind of challenge I enjoy in this series, and whenever other games feature them, I give them a look. The other thing with endurance races in this game is that due to the length of them, Mistakes are a lot more recoverable in the event that you make them. It can be a bit too easy to make incidents inconsequential for you. On top of that, you can make your car just a bit too good for these races. In just my first race, I was lapping cars every few laps, because I customised my car too well. 
and since I can't really find an appropriate place to talk about this particular problem, here we'll have to do. There is an issue with progression in this game, in that during the course of my over 20 hours of playtime in this game, I've had two instances of the game softlocking. For those unaware, a softlock is when the game doesn't obviously crash, but doesn't allow the player to progress any further, requiring a restart of the game and reloading from a prior save. Having done two whole two hour streams where my progress was nullified, it was very disappointing to see this, and it shows how rushed this game's development got towards the end, where weird bugs and glitches leached their way into the game. And the last problem with the progression in this game is that there's only so much you can do in terms of events. Fortunately, however, this is the sort of thing that improves in later games as more cars become available. There's no way to sugarcoat this, really. Gran Turismo is a repetitive game. The gameplay loop is essentially get a car, tune it, race in a championship, get prizes, repeat. Unless the thrill of discovering how fast you can go entices you, you're going to want to put this down before long. It's not like this game is bereft of stuff to do, though. Whilst Gran Turismo has a somewhat limited number of events to take part in, they are at least repeatable, and they have enough variety to allow you to try out many different cars. There are events that change depending on the car's powertrain layout, weight, or manufacturer nationality, and there are events that exist for the degree to which your car has been modified. That is, at all, or not at all. Ultimately, the final championship you do before you can wrap this game up is the Gran Turismo World Championship. It is a six-race series which sees you competing at the top level of competition in the game, but you may find yourself a bit too prepared for it if you know what you're doing. That said, if you do win the championship, you are greeted with a nice prize pot, as well as a credit sequence complete with music that can be best described as so cheesy it has the effect of making Brian Adams seem like Darily. But that's not all. Upon completing the championship, you unlock an extra event in the special catalogue, Gran Turismo Hi-Fi. It is a unique event option that has parallels to what Ridge Racer did with the release of R4. Instead of running at 240p at 30 frames per second like it normally does, you can play at 60 frames per second in 480i. Impressive, really. So how did it do that? Well, it simplifies the track geometry and scenery and makes it a pure time trial. I do love seeing things like this because it does show that there were serious attempts at squeezing everything out of the PlayStation. And whilst there was definitely room for more, it's fair to say that the developers got a lot out of the PlayStation already with this game. And with that, I think it's time that we talk about Gran Turismo's legacy. The one thing that has to be talked about when talking about Gran Turismo, 25 years after its release, is just how significant a franchise it turned out to be. One can argue that other franchises took its mantle as a bridge for accessible simulation, but one thing's hard to argue. Gran Turismo made it possible. As I alluded to earlier, racing games, unless it was the whole point of them, tended not to be too concerned about the realism involved, just that you could drive cars and race them. Not inherently a bad thing, but it did show that there was a gap in the market. Racing simulations have existed for a while, but they were the domain of the PC. Games like Jeff Crammon's Formula One Grand Prix series and Papyrus's IndyCar Racing and NASCAR Racing series of games took on more of a simulated approach, which allowed for some marketability while still confined to a niche. That Gran Turismo was able to bridge the gap between the thrill of racing with a realistic approach to driving and physics enabled it to succeed in ways few games were able to at the time. It is the PlayStation's best-selling game of all time, and one of only two games to breach 10 million lifetime sales. A new vein could be struck now. Gran Turismo proved that you could make simulation marketable, and it encouraged a number of imitators, in much the same way Doom did in 1993 albeit with varying degrees of staying power. One of the first noteworthy ones was Squaresoft's own attempt at a racing sim called Driving Emotion Type S. It launched on the same month as the PlayStation 2, and by and large, it was poor. Its driving model was horrible, in that it controls like you're doing a gravel or snow rally, but on tarmac. 
It also doesn't help that it's not very visually appealing. The game only sold as well as it did because Gran Turismo 3 A spec was yet to hit the market for another year. Supposedly its physics were improved somewhat for the western release, but frankly I'm not sure I'm convinced this is fixable. If you've seen Ross Scott's review of Test Drive 4, where the steering in that game is such an uncooperative mess, then you'll understand very quickly why this game is bad. Driving a motion type S is purely and simply broken. Our Racing Revolution was a fair bit better however. A spin-off of the Ridge Racer series developed by Namco, it took on more of a story driven approach and had some cool features in it. For instance, you can pressurise the AI by looming large in its mirrors and if you accumulate enough pressure on the car ahead, you can get them to make mistakes. It's a little undercooked and seems a bit contrived, but damn if it doesn't feel at least somewhat entertaining. The driving model is by and large decent enough, although I would argue it's a bit of a mixed bag overall, since there's only so many tracks in this game and there isn't much scope for customization. There are two other games I will mention, but I haven't played either of them, so I'll give a relatively brief mention of one before diving into the other here. And I'll start with Konami's efforts, called Enthusia Professional Racing. I'm not remotely familiar with this game, but based on some of the stuff I'm seeing about it, it might be worth a look. It did release around the time of Gran Turismo 4, so that may have damaged its potential somewhat, but it seems to have been a pretty competent game all told. The other game I want to mention is one that largely serves as the rival franchise to Gran Turismo. It released as an Xbox exclusive series and serves as one of the bedrocks of Microsoft's gaming arm, Forza Motorsport. The first entry in Turn 10's racing franchise was very well received at the time, thanks to what reviewers at the time perceived as the ways to get the advantage on the contemporaneous Gran Turismo 4. Add online multiplayer and a proper damage model, the latter being something the Gran Turismo franchise has been reticent to include. There have been other series such as the Toka Race Driver series of games by Codemasters that filled in the niche of professional race car driving games in something of the same vein as Gran Turismo, but on the whole Gran Turismo stood as an army of one in its genre for roughly a decade. More recent games such as Project Cars and even full blown racing simulation games such as R Factor 2, Automobilista and the seemingly ubiquitous iRacing have taken the simulation aspect further whilst Gran Turismo is content to make itself the gateway drug for getting into racing in an accessible way. And on that note, let's talk about the things it did to get people into racing, because that is one big thing about this game I don't tend to hear about all that many other games, despite how groundbreaking it is all things considered. Gran Turismo served as the way by which some racing drivers found their way into motorsport in the real world, even today. Drivers such as Lucas Ordonez, Jan Mardenborough and Igor Fraga made their names in the racing world by starting out with humble beginnings by playing games in this series. You're probably even vaguely aware of some content creators who have made their name in the racing world in recent years because of Gran Turismo. I'm talking in particular about Jimmy Broadbent. He's been pretty successful so far, as have Lucas, Jan and Igor. Jimmy even serves as a co-commentator on official Gran Turismo Championship broadcasts, which is cool. The series has also received recognition from other real world racing drivers, such as with an awkward advert featuring father and son racing duo Martin and Alex Brundle. Endorsements didn't end there though, as there was another endorsement from a little known driver who I don't think many people have heard of at all, a certain Lewis Hamilton. Gran Turismo Sport contains a DLC pack of time trials that you can compete in to beat Hamilton's fastest time, and my understanding is that they are immensely difficult. Not very surprising really, he is Lewis Hamilton after all. Not least of all however, is Kazunori Yamauchi himself. He became a racing driver after having made these games, having taken part several times in the 24 hours of Nürburgring, winning twice in his class. Getting into motorsport is expensive, 
in many cases prohibitively so. In the case of Lewis Hamilton and more recently Esteban Ocon, getting into Formula 1 took untold amounts of work and ambition and parents who worked to the bone to be able to take their kids racing. Although it is still the case that motorsport is expensive, Gran Turismo enabled an alternative avenue by which people could compete. You didn't need to be ultra wealthy or impossibly lucky to get to race with the big boys quite as much as you once needed. All you needed was a PlayStation, a copy of Gran Turismo and the desire to be the best on track. It inspired a generation of folks to become racing drivers and that it did so this well shows how much of an impact Gran Turismo left on the world of motorsports. Naturally, Gran Turismo's success caused it to do a lot of things within Sony, as well as in the motorsport world. The sheer volume of sales the game garnered saw Sony give Polis Entertainment a new opportunity. Initially, it started as an internal studio within Sony Computer Entertainment, but because of what Gran Turismo brought to the table, it was ultimately decided that Polis Entertainment would be spun off into a dedicated development studio separate from the larger Sony Computer Entertainment structure, so that whilst it's still a first party studio for Sony, it has greater autonomy now. It even got a new name, Polyphony Digital. The team went ahead and worked on three games simultaneously after Gran Turismo's release. The first one making it to market being Omega Boost, a mecha action game made by members of the team that worked on Sega's Panzer Dragoon series. I made a review of this game, you can check it out in the corner up there. A direct follow on from Gran Turismo, Gran Turismo 2, released in 1999 and expanded the game in many ways. More cars and makes, more tracks such as real world circuits like Laguna Seca, new means of racing including rally and even a better driving model helped to make Gran Turismo 2 a very compelling package indeed. I even prefer this game to the original. Developed in tandem with Gran Turismo 2 was the first game in the series to hit the PlayStation 2, that being Gran Turismo 3 A Spec. I kid you not, when I was a child I genuinely believed what I was seeing was real. It blew me away back then, it didn't have nearly the amount of cars or tracks Gran Turismo 2 had, but it was still good. Gran Turismo 2 and Gran Turismo 3 A-Spec being made at the same time did ultimately mean the games were divergent in terms of content, and Gran Turismo 2 had way more cars and tracks, but Gran Turismo 3 had far higher fidelity than what Gran Turismo 2 could offer, even if it was quite the looker by PlayStation standards. Then came the first of the side releases that filled in the gap between the mainline entries, starting with Gran Turismo Concept. Depending on where you were in the world, it would have a different name. It featured different cars and a few unique circuits, but otherwise played like a compressed ball of Gran Turismo 3 A spec. Following on came Gran Turismo 4 Prologue, a game that released with a handful of new tracks and cars structured like a long license test. It would serve as a starter to the main course that was Gran Turismo 4. Way more cars, way more tracks, way more races a slightly understeery but no less fun driving model. This, right here, is my favourite racing game of all time, because I have never played something that made me feel at one with the car in the same way as this without being awkward. There was a brief lull as development for the HD era of Gran Turismo began, with Gran Turismo HD concept showing off what it could do. It also marked the first entry with Ferrari's presence in the franchise. Later it was followed by Gran Turismo 5 Prologue, which polished the HD concept up, put in a bunch of tracks and cars and gave the player a taster of what to expect for the eventual, and much delayed, Gran Turismo 5. Before that however, there was a PlayStation Portable release, simply called Gran Turismo. It's a simple racing game made for the portable platform, and it worked pretty well. I can't imagine playing it for extended periods though with the weird thumbstick thing and all. Now, Gran Turismo 5. It introduced several new paradigms to the series, including NASCAR, and it even brought on the likes of Jeff Gordon to teach you how to wheel around Daytona and Indianapolis. The game had a few issues though. 
It didn't quite live up to the technical and graphical standards most expected of polyphony, but on top of that, corners had clearly been cut with the standard and premium car distinctions, where some cars had fully modelled interiors and others made it seem like you were racing in the void. However, the introduction of the performance points system and the levelling up system helped things somewhat and you could even drive Kimi Raikkonen's 2007 championship winning Ferrari if you wanted to. Not in the races, but you could still drive it in time trials. Eventually, Gran Turismo 6 released and it gave me the tone of a greatest hits collection of Gran Turismo rather than a full-blooded game in its own right. It did have some great things about it, I loved the Ayaton Senna update and the game had a dizzying array of cars to drive and tracks to drive them on, but the focus had been lost and it didn't know what it wanted to be anymore. Gran Turismo 6 was also the weakest selling game in the main franchise, which did not help matters. So it was important for the next game to hit it out of the park, and I think it would be fair to say that it did that. Gran Turismo Sports released in 2017, but it took a major left turn for the franchise, in that it wasn't just a game where you bought a car and upgraded it. Instead, the focus was very much on online play. You competed against racers online and climbed the ranks, somewhat like how most esports games work. The game was criticised for its significant lack of single player modes, and playing offline is virtually impossible, but I'll be damned if I didn't have a good time playing it. It felt taut, fun, and some of the best races I've ever had in games have come from this game. Sometime after, there was some cautious optimism when Gran Turismo 7 was unveiled to the world, featuring some redeveloped racetracks from previous games, with the new Trial Mountain and Deep Forest tracks given some showing off. It would eventually release on both the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, marking a departure for the series which tended to release on only one platform at a time, though it made sense since buying a house was easier than buying a PlayStation 5 at the time of its launch. It has clearly had a lot of work done, and a lot of new cars and features are included, with new and unique challenges, but the realism got taken a bit too far. Not in terms of the driving model, that's all hunky-dory. My issue is the in-game economy. For the longest time, you couldn't even sell cars, and many of the cars that you wanted to drive were, simply, far too expensive to buy, leading you to either pay through the nose in microtransaction fees or grind your way until you finally got the car you wanted. And to complicate matters, there's an inbuilt inflation mechanic, so prices rise just as they do in the real world. Great! It's the most recent entry in the franchise and whilst I've had a good time driving in it, the game sits at the lowest user rating for any Gran Turismo game on Metacritic because the in-game economy is so patently unfair. It took the one aspect of car culture nobody likes, sheer brutal expense, and made it a feature. Here's hoping things improve, however. The ability to sell your duplicate cars is a welcome and much needed addition to the game, which, if it weren't for the busted economy, would be so much more fun to play. Where the franchise will go later, I cannot tell. I just hope that it doesn't keep making the mistake of tying itself too closely to the real world when it is simply not necessary. If I wanted to be subjected to abject misery with no money and no real idea of what to do next, I'd play Pathologic. I'm the only one alive in this town. What a story, Mark. So to wrap up this review in a neat little bow, Gran Turismo is a groundbreaking game that tore up the racing game development rulebook and showed everyone how you do it properly. Tight controls, a solid physics engine, challenging tracks, and an awareness of what it wants to be, a celebration of car culture. It celebrates the whole idea of buying a car and modifying it to your heart's content. It's wonderful like that. The only criticisms I'd offer are mostly technical issues and not really anything that's a deal breaker. As a game of its age, Gran Turismo did a lot more than many other games did at the time, and it succeeded for it. It's little wonder it has as much staying power as it does. 
This leads me onto my recommendations for this game, particularly in regards to language requirements and importability. I'll start on the aspect of language, since this is going to be a little bit weird. I would say understanding Japanese isn't really that much of a requirement when playing this game. Now, there's a bit to unpack with this, but on the whole, you can get by fine without worrying a great deal about it. There is a surprising amount of English in the game, with most of the key information in English and providing you with an overall solid idea of what you're meant to do. Also, if you can read katakana, you can read most of the stuff you need pretty easily. Where knowledge of Japanese would come in useful is with part descriptions and license test explanations. Otherwise, for the most part, you can play this game without really needing to worry about anything. And now, importability. Simply put, this game is a dime a dozen, pretty much. Unless it's a particularly pristine copy, prices tend to be no more than a few hundred yen or a few dollars. It's one of those games that if you can get it on eBay or something like that, it's pretty easy to ship over. I wouldn't contemplate using a proxy service just to buy this one game, but I'm not going to tell you how to do that. Well, not yet, anyway. If you buy from a retro games fair, you'll easily find copies of the game, imported or not, for just a few quid or a few dollars, depending on where you are in the world. It's not expensive in the least. A tenner is quite easily reasonable for this game, considering the amount of time you'll spend with it. All in all, Gran Turismo is a superb racing game, and it brought the spirit of realistic racing competition to the mainstream, and it sparked a new paradigm in the racing genre. It's bettered by games in the same series, and I don't doubt some will say this series is bettered by other series today, but every one of them should pay respects to this truly foundational game. Long live Gran Turismo! If you have any suggestions of what I should cover, please let me know. I am open to covering most things. In my description you will find a link to my website, daniellearmouth.com, where you will find my retro import collection and wishlist. Also in the description are a few social media links. There is naturally my Twitter, but I've also been using Instagram a fair bit as of recent. So if you want to check that out, go right ahead. Otherwise, there is my Twitter to keep up to date with everything that I'm up to. As ever though, this has been Daniel Learmouth. Happy Holidays, and Sidi. I forgot about tourist trophy!